great. So, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, just wanted to start off by um, thanking QRCA because I became a member of that organization back in 2006, and that's where I first got exposed to online immersive qualitative, and it really set me off on a whole trajectory for the specialty in my practice. And uh, then along the way, I met other collaborators like Kristen uh, and lots of other QRCA members that I've had the pleasure to work with on projects over the years. And Kristen and I presented on Mobile Qualitative together a couple years ago, um, and a lot's changed since then, so I'm excited to give an update on that and share some projects. Well, lots changed for me, too, personally, but more importantly, in the world of mobile quality. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, let's see here. Next. Dana? Yes. Um, Am I okay? You're fine, but I just wanted to say one other thing to the audience. Dana is going to be sharing with you other QRSA members who have contributed their little case study for this talk today. If you want to learn more about a particular case study, just remember their name, and when you go to the QRCA website, you can look up under Find a Researcher and get in contact with them to learn more. Yep. Um, all right, so we all know um, that uh, sharing um, is part of daily life for consumers these days, sharing via mobile. So I'm not going to go over these numbers. I mean, you heard a lot about this um, in the P&G talk earlier, but this is what makes using mobile qualitative possible and makes us successful is just the fact that consumers are already sharing very vivid and rich pictures, videos, and sound bites of their lives every day. And on top of the numbers that you see here, you know, smartphone penetration is more than half of all mobile phones that are out there. So it's really um, enabling consumers to share in, in those rich and vivid ways. And in the last couple of years, the mobile qualitative platforms have really caught up to that technology and, and began to take full advantage of it. Um, the online qualitative providers that now include mobile um, in their platforms tend to do it for free. It's just a seamless extension of the data collection and everything's aggregated on the back end so it's much easier for analysis and to follow participants all the way through a study and including their online and mobile data collection. Um, they're also building in some really unique uh, and useful features like the ability for participants to use their voice to text features to leave nice long rich text messages or even the ability for participants to respond offline to mobile uh, questions and then upload those later when they're back to a um, you know, hotspot or, or Wi-Fi connection. So um, the tools are really evolving and maturing and these are some of the uh, examples of the rich interfaces that we're, you know, we're seeing here. Um, as Kristen mentioned, I'm gonna share um, several examples and I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly. Um, these are provided by um, other members of QRCA, Rosalia Barnes, Jennifer Dale, Julie Francis, Ilka Kuhagen, Betsy Leichleiter, Pia malbeck Verbeek, Dory Painter, and even Kristen. So I want to just thank you all for the contributions. Thanks to these researchers for their contributions today to make this all possible. So these are the names you'd look up on the website, and I'll mention them as we go through the case studies. Um, because I'm moving so quickly through the case studies, I'm only going to be addressing how mobile was used and what mobile did within the studies, but they tend to be multi-part studies, hybrid designs where researchers are using online, mobile, and maybe even in-person in combination. So just something to keep in mind. I'm only going to hit on what the mobile did within uh, most of these examples. Um, so uh, we've titled the session Mobile Qual in the Moment, or is in the moment. And there's a lot of advantages and benefits that mobile qualitative can, can bring to helping uh, us be more in the here and now of consumers' lives. And I'm gonna hit on these as I show you the case studies. Um, the idea of being more ubiquitous, um, getting that context or contextual experience, being unobtrusive, even revealing the unconscious. Um, what, like we heard in the, the P&G presentation about an hour ago, the idea, the differences between what consumers say they do and what they actually do. So I'll show you some examples of that. Um, and then also just getting immediate feedback and, uh, and being able to capture that spontaneously. So I'll show you some examples of each of these. So starting with an example from Julie Francis um, on grocery shopping moments. I think you'd expect to see an example on retail shopping or grocery shopping here. Um, and this, uh, this hits on the idea of um, being more ubiquitous using mobile qualitative. And in this study, um, Julie's client wanted to understand how consumers were using their smartphones within the multi-channel grocery shopping experience. So they were tasked with using their phones to record any moment in which they were you know, using their smartphone to, to do a task related to grocery shopping. So that included and it became the range of showing things like mobile couponing, mobile purchasing, using their phones to scan barcodes and get more information about products or do price comparisons. 
making their grocery lists on their phones. So it really allowed us, uh, allowed them in the study to see a whole process and see a behavior from multiple angles um, using the, the mobile device. Another uh, example that I thought related well to the idea of ubiquity was just this notion of kind of going anywhere and everywhere with your participants, uh, which Ilka Kuhagen uh, did in a study about young adults' nutrition. Uh, she wanted to be in those moments when uh, young adults were eating their meals and be able to probe them no matter where they were, even if that meant going to Oktoberfest virtually, which is what she did here in this picture. Uh, she used text to communicate with participants when they were in a very noisy situation, a very crowded situation, somewhere that it just would have been impractical for her to be a part of without interrupting the normal course of events or probably even to have a really good, clear conversation with them. Um, and you can see in this chain of text here, she was actually probing this participant while he was at Oktoberfest. He says, I've just eaten a half chicken, and, so she, and he's in a box with 20 friends, and he's got vouchers for food, and everything tastes good. And then she just gets to ask him more about, what did you eat the chicken with? And he says, well, nothing, because the voucher's only 10 euro, but I did get a beer. So you know where his priorities are. Um, so interesting examples on ubiquity there. Um, a couple of examples on gathering context using mobile. And you know, context can be very helpful when we want to better understand and interpret those behaviors and attitudes that we're later learning about. Uh, and Dory Painter provided this example of um, needing to learn more about the breakfast experience in limited service hotels uh, among business travelers. And her client was actually the manufacturer of waffle batter uh, that gets used in these hotels. But they needed to really understand this context of breakfast and what was happening there. And what, you know, what choices were getting made, why those were getting made, and that would help them better understand you know, what was going on with waffles and what the opportunity was. So she recruited, limited, or she recruited business travelers um, within their trips. So she did some creative recruiting to get them to snap photos while this experience was on their radar, as she put it. Um, Another example of gathering context, again, a retail example I think you would expect to see is, uh, this was one from my own work where um, had my client wanted to better understand how to optimize their seasonal merchandising and how shoppers were making decisions in their store. Uh, so what we, what we did was we, you know, we wanted to better understand, well, what were they experiencing, first of all? You know, what were they noticing in terms of assortment and items and merchandising and signage and all of those things that might be either adding to their shopping experience or taking away from their shopping experience? And we wanted to look in their stores and in competitive stores. So we sent shoppers out with their mobile devices and we had them record photos and send us back um, uh, written, written messages to go with those of just anything that they noticed that either added to or detracted from their experience while they were shopping for seasonal merchandise in these stores. It gave us a very um, rich body of work to build on before we actually went and did uh, shop-alongs in stores and so we could probe on things that some of the issues really weren't expected to be a big part of the in-store, but they became a bigger part of it because of what we learned through the mobile experience. Okay. Um, a couple of issues that related to being unobtrusive. Uh, and certainly we heard about this with the P&G experience. Um, but uh, this, so this one's dialed back a little bit from that. Um, one of my clients was a, a shaving gel client and wanted to understand uh, what women were doing in terms of their leg care routines as, you know, so that they could explore positioning opportunities for the brand. And so what we, what we had women do was actually go take us into their bathrooms and, and showers, and uh, bathtubs and, and showers, I should say, and tell us, uh, show us what their leg care ritual looked like, and then tell us a story uh, as if they were blogging online and writing their own column about leg care. And these are some of the pictures that we got back, and you know, we really uh, got some interesting stuff around how women were creating these elaborate experiential rituals around their whole legs day, where they had music and coffee and um, you know, candlelight. Um, sometimes even they called it this get your sexy on moment so they could walk away feeling kind of sexy and ready to go out on their date or just ready to go to work. So um, those were some interest. that was an interesting study. Um, Another way that um, mobile has been used to be unobtrusive in, in my work um, was this particular study about moments of connection. And here, we wanted to know how women were connecting with others uh, when they were having these meaningful moments of connection throughout their, their day. Um, we actually tasked women with um, sending us voicemail messages. So it's a little bit of a different use of mobile. 
um, to describe these moments of connection. And they carried around a, a little pocket card that had five or six talking points um, that we wanted to hear in their story of their moment of connection. And we asked them to talk to us about the moment as if they were talking to a good friend. And so they began to, uh, over time, as they left us more and more messages about these moments of connection, they began to emote a lot more, they began to leave a lot more information, and we would get voicemail messages sometimes that were four and five minutes long. And this is just a small excerpt from one that came uh, where she was telling us about her experience of waking up and spending some time with her husband alone before the baby woke up and how important that moment was for them to have some together time. Um, certainly, you know, this isn't a moment that you could have captured by being there uh, in person or really, um, you know, any other way that I can effectively think of. So uh, we were really pleased with the ability to kind of get inside these moments from an unobtrusive perspective with mobile. Unconscious. So this goes back to the idea of what they say versus what they do not always being the same things. And a couple of examples here. Um, one uh, was from my own work uh, within the area of on-the-go snack packaging where um, we had consumers go out and record in video and in you know, short text messages their experiences using snacks on the go, whether that was at their office, you know, in the car, which you see a lot of here, um, or anywhere away from home. And uh, we, while consumers were telling us in their you know, written evaluation of the packaging use that they were satisfied and it worked well, what we could see from the videos is they were actually struggling to open packages, they were struggling to keep packages closed, things were spilling in their car, they were using workarounds like baggies on their lap. Um, so there was a lot revealed in terms of innovation opportunity by looking at what they were doing, even, even though they were describing you know, a, a kind of a different story to us in the same, you know, in the same breath. So um, we thought that was a very interesting um, dichotomy and, and something that we could leverage for innovation opportunity for the client. Similarly, uh, Betsy Leichleiter uh, and Rosalia Barnes provided this example about employee communications where uh, they were studying employees who were receiving a high volume of communications on multiple screens. And their goal was to better understand how to manage these communications and make them more action-oriented for their clients. So they started the study by having, um, by having the participants record those experiences when they were receiving the communications and classify them as something they might act on, hold, or disregard. And Betsy and her team, from looking at the footage that they were getting back uh, via mobile, started to pick up on these triggers that, would, um, uh, that were unconscious triggers that the participants weren't even aware of that, would, uh, that lined up with whether something became an action on hold or discard type of message. They would pick up on things like the inclusion of a calendar invite or a timely deadline or the timeliness of the communication itself not things that the employees were articulating to them as uh, triggers for how they, you know, what makes something actionable or manageable, but certainly something that the team was able to pick up on from observe, observing the behaviors in mobile. Okay. So last two points here on um, immediacy and then spontaneity. So I've got a couple of examples in each area. Um, in terms of immediacy, this is a study that uh, Kristen Schweitzer did with some partners. It was really one of the first qualitative studies that I was ever exposed to, may, uh, maybe the very first one of mobile qualitative studies, I should say. Um, the idea here was to record the Super Bowl watching experience in a very vivid and rich way and turn those results around in less than 24 hours so they could be talked at at the water cooler the next day. Um, and so this was, uh, in this uh, example, participants were sent, um, sent a link right after the halftime show, and they were asked to take pictures of what they were doing, what kinds of foods and beverages they were uh, using, uh, what team they were rooting for, any commercials that they'd seen uh, that they thought were interesting or not so interesting. So they got a wide breadth of, um, of you know, touch points and um, collected in those moments and created a very rich picture of what the Super Bowl watching experience was all about, not just what ads people were liking that year. And all of this was, this was over 200 participants and all of this was posted online the very next day so it could be you know, still very relevant and, uh, to, uh, to, to chat about during the Super Bowl uh, kind of after show, if you will. Okay, so good example on immediacy and here's another example on immediacy. Um, this was from Jennifer Dale who, um, was doing a study for a client around uh, nutrition or developing a nutritional app and she used what she called a mobile sandwich approach where she had a phase of mobile on the front end and a phase of mobile on the back end and what was happening here in both of those phases was 
Um, she was watching participants. She wanted to watch participants actually consume meals and then immediately give it a nutrition score from poor to excellent. Um, and so that she's getting that real visceral reaction and assessment of how well they were doing you know, with, with nutrition in their meal. And in the first phase, it was uninfluenced. They didn't have the app. In the second phase, they did have the app and it was influenced so she could compare both of those sets of results. But getting that immediate visceral reaction right in the moment was very helpful and she was able to get that with mobile. Um, I, just a couple of, uh, to wrap up here, I know we're at time, so uh, on spontaneity, I'll just mention, uh, Kristen and I used, um, uh, did a study for youth lacrosse where um, we wanted to uh, ca capture examples of sportsmanship uh, within the game, and these are some of the photos that you, uh, some of the photos that were sent back that we collected. We also collected video and other written messages. Um, the notion here, I, I think, um, we were able to get some spontaneous footage of good examples of sportsmanship in the game, like the coach making calls or the team coming together. It's tricky to get spontaneous feedback. You, know, you have to set your participants up to expect that, to kind of stand ready. Um, but you can do it, and we did get some examples of that and learned a lot about the importance of those instructions. Um, another example of spontaneity, which was really unique, coming from uh, Mia, uh, Pia Malbec verbeek um, was a study that they conducted on water budgeting in India where um, they placed flip videos and mobile devices w within lo uh, lower socioeconomic households so that they could capture the not only the rationing of water or the rationing of water um, because water supply is limited and was only sent to families for a few hours a day and so they had to be you know very um, strategic about how they used it and these moments of use and capture were um, kind of occurring throughout the day and very spontaneous so the use of mobile here was also very advantageous. Um, so I'll leave you just with the thought that you know, more transparency and fewer boundaries we're getting with mobile. We're getting to see consumers' lives in a richer and um, in fuller way. And I'll open it up to questions. Is my mic on again? OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Dana, first of all. Thank you. I'm Process-wise, I'm going to ask whoever's setting up for the expert panel if that can be done in the background while we field a couple questions for Dana. I can come down to that. Is that We're going to put the chairs right oh, here. Okay. Um, so for, for the audience, if you have a question or two, let's go ahead and field those. Can you hear me? Yeah. So where are you with live mobile ethnography? Um, it appears that all of these, were they all um, pre-taped and then uploaded somewhere? And if so, where do you find that you're going to be with live mobile ethnography probing in the moment? Moderator-based, perhaps? Right, yes. Um, some, some of the platforms are, are, do allow you to do probing in the moment. Some of them don't. So, um, and, and Kristen, if you have an, a better update on this, let me know. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, that would certainly be a, an, an advantage uh, to be able to really connect with consumers in those moments and probe further into them. Um, if you set up, you can kind of, you can kind of work around it now where you might set up specific times of day when you want people interacting and you can probe them, although those probes would come back online in some cases, but in some of the platforms, the probes do come to their mobile devices, so they can respond right there. So um, so, there, so you can get pretty close to probing in, in the moment uh, with, you know, depending on the platform that you're using, but certainly it's an advantage to get that. There's always a lot of online follow-up for me right now. Hi. Um, did you uh, have any feedback from the researchers themselves at, and their use of mobile, um, perhaps uh, to field the questions or ex in looking at the studies as it's happening? Did they use the mobile, like for instance, a bulletin board? Yeah, so is your, is your question, I'm sorry, I don't do know you, if I- Do you have any feedback from the researchers? Mm -hmm. Did they use mobile themselves to interact with the people oh, using okay. mobile? Oh, okay, sorry, okay, I got it. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know how many of these uh, did that. Um, I myself am not using uh, mobile to you know, probe and respond. I think Ilka might have been doing it some in her study about young, young adults' nutrition when she was texting. Um, but uh, generally, um, generally, I'm online when I'm seeing this because it's easier to kind of see all of the information coming in that way. Uh, so I, I don't know if anyone's experience has been different than that, but that's, you know, that's kind of how I do it. <laughs> Correct. Most of the probing that is being done is still via computer for the moderator. Mm -hmm. One final question, and then we'll go to the panel, if there is one. 
Okay, if I could please give another round of applause Thank for you. Dana, first of all.